Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, uh, the Sylvia Group webinar on Medicare Open Enrollment for 2019. I'm Vin Sylvia, Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications, and in a few moments, I'll be introducing our featured presenter, health insurance expert, Julie Jennings. First, I'll address a few procedural matters regarding questions that may arise during the presentation. Please notice the box that appears on the GoToWebinar screen. That enables you to type in a question. If time allows, at the end of Julie's presentation, we'll conclude the webinar by having her answer general Medicare questions from our audience. If we're out of time, we'll include questions and answers on our website in the blog post we'll publish later this week. If you have specific questions regarding your own Medicare coverage, you can email or call Julie, and she'll be happy to answer them for you. Her contact information will appear in the last slide of her presentation. And now a few words about Julie. A health insurance professional for more than 30 years and a member of Sylvia Group since 1987, she is a registered health underwriter and licensed insurance advisor who has earned certifications in long-term care, consumer-driven health care, and the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. She is also certified for Medicare Advantage as required by the federal government for anyone serving as an agent for or advisor on that coverage. In addition to having served on the National Association of Health Underwriters Board of Trustees from 2011 to 2015, Julie is a past president and current board member of the Massachusetts and Maine chapters of NAHU. She received the National Organization's Distinguished Service Award in 2016 for her lifetime commitment to both her profession and her community. Julie is a frequent speaker locally and nationally on health reform and health insurance topics, presenting to business and civic groups. She also teaches entrepreneurship and business concepts to area students as a volunteer and longtime board member for the Junior Achievement of Southern Massachusetts. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Julie Jennings. Okay, thanks a lot, Vin. Uh, welcome, everyone, on this beautiful fall day, and happy open enrollment. Here we are on October 16th. Medicare open enrollment started yesterday. So we're going to um, go through some information that will hopefully help you out um, during open enrollment and throughout the year. <clears throat> So let's start out by saying, what is Medicare? It's the closest thing we have to national health insurance in the United States. In fact, um, we currently provide health insurance to about 60 million Americans through Medicare. That's approximately one in every six people. Generally, to be eligible for Medicare, you must be a United States citizen or a legal resident for at least five years in a row. Medicare is primarily the insurance for older Americans who are age 65 or older, but also includes coverage for certain people with disabilities who are under age 65. This includes um, those who are receiving Social Security Disability Income Benefits, SSDI, um, for 24 months, which would then make them eligible for Medicare after that time period. Um, also, Immediately upon diagnosis for Lou Gehrig's disease, um, a person is eligible for Medicare. And at any age for uh, diagnosis of end-stage renal disease, which is um, defined as permanent kidney failure um, with someone either on dialysis or requiring a kidney transplant. While Medicare is the health insurance for older persons, um, it should not be confused with Medicaid which is the health insurance for people with limited financial resources or income. Although some people may qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid, um, this is not something that we'll be uh, discussing in today's program. So there are a few players um, who are involved in, in Medicare, and uh, most of you know the Social Security Administration. They're the ones that give us our Social Security checks if we're um, receiving retirement or disability. Um, but they handle the enrollment for Medicare for determining what premium payments are to be made for Medicare and issuing ID cards. Um, if you are a retiree um, from the railroad, then the Railroad Retirement Board actually 
um, serves those functions for railroad employees. Um, CMS, or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, is the agency that does everything else. Um, they're the ones that determine what's covered, who's, who's covered, how it's covered. And um, so they, they have a lot of responsibility within the Medicare system. Social Security Administration um, is, I mentioned they're, they're issuing ID cards or replacement cards for people. And they're also the ones that are issuing new Medicare ID cards to everyone who already has a Medicare card as we transition away from Social Security numbers to unique identifiers for um, Medicare in the future. There are four parts to Medicare coverage, not to be confusing, but because um, Medicare has evolved over the last 50 years um, from the first um, Medicare legislation that was passed by President Johnson in 1965. So Part A and Part B, uh, medical insurance and hospital insurance, are known as original Medicare. They are the first first Medicare coverages that were passed through legislation, and they include some basic coverages for inpatient and outpatient care. Um, since that time, uh, there was a, another law passed that enabled Medicare Advantage, or Part C, plans. And um, while the original Medicare is managed by the federal government, Medicare Advantage plans are instead managed by private insurers who are approved by the government. They must provide coverage um, for everything that you would have covered under original Medicare, um, and then more, often including additional services that are not typically covered by Medicare, such as eye exams, hearing aids, dental benefits, and so forth. Um, most Medicare Advantage plans also include prescription drug coverage, although that prescription drug plan is the fourth part of Medicare. Um, so we refer to Part D for prescription drugs, um, and we'll hear a lot more about that um, going forward. But uh, this was as a result of an, a law, the Medicare Modernization Act law that was implemented in 2006, um, which made it a requirement for all Medicare members to have prescription coverage. So by making it a requirement that everyone have prescription coverage, the thought process is that that should lower the cost of prescription um, for us. You can't wait until you need it to get it. Um, so when you look at the four parts, you could potentially have Part A insurance, Part B insurance, and Part D insurance to cover your hospitalization, outpatient, and, and drug. Or you could just have Part C coverage, Medicare Advantage, which would incorporate your hospital, medical, and drug in one plan. Looking at Part A hospital insurance, um, it although it is referred to as hospital insurance, it covers other things. It covers skilled rehabilitation, psychiatric care, skilled uh, nursing facility, home health care, and hospice care. So, and then uh, you know, it covers uh, blood, inpatient blood. So not covered as things that are typically not covered by any insurance, um, private rooms unless necessary, television, et cetera. So what does uh, Medicare Part A cost and what outpatient uh, or what out-of-pocket costs do you have with Medicare Part A? First of all, most people don't pay premium for Part A. That's because you and I contribute to Medicare during our working years through payroll taxes, and um, if you or your spouse have 40 quarters of Medicare wages during your work, working life, then your Part A medical insurance is free. If you, if you don't have 40 quarters, less than 40 quarters, um, you will have to pay for Part A insurance, and in 2019, the maximum cost for that is as high as $437 per month. So that would be for someone who has less than 30 quarters. Um, Medicare Part A also has deductibles and copayments, and these are adjusted each year for inflation. So, for example, in um, 2018, the Medicare um, Part A deductible for hospitalization was $1,340. In 2019, it will be $1,364. So 
yes, those deductibles do keep going up. The deductible is incurred on a, um, for a benefit period, which I, I want to discuss. But um, it's $1,364 for the first 60 days of a benefit period. If you are hospitalized longer than 60 days, you then end up with a daily copayment for your hospitalization. From 61 to 90 days, you'll be responsible for $341 a day. And for um, days beyond the 90th day, $682 per day. There is a cap um, for Medicare Part A of, of benefit period, and Medicare stops paying after uh, 150 days of inpatient care. So there is no benefit after that. You're responsible for the full amount. Now, um, most of us do think of a deductible as applying on a calendar year basis, or if you have a health plan now that with a July 1 anniversary, it's a policy year, but it's 12 months. And in the case of Part A Medicare, the deductible is a benefit period deductible. And a benefit period commences on the first day that you're admitted to the hospital or skilled nursing facility, and it ends after you've been out of that facility for 60 consecutive days. So that means that you could end up with multiple deductibles in a calendar year and multiple benefit periods depending on what your health care needs are. Um, since there's no out-of-pocket maximum on Medicare Part A, that means that there is no limit to how many deductibles you might end up having to pay in a year or how many um, inpatient daily copayments you're responsible for in any one year. I also want to mention that all the figures that we're talking about today are 2019 figures. Um, they were just released um, by CMS on Friday, October 12th. So, um, it's good timing that we're able to incorporate that into today's um, presentation. So skilled nursing facility care um, has some pretty hefty um, and strict conditions applied to meet, um, to meet eligibility for coverage. So your doctor, first of all, has to certify that your condition requires daily skilled nursing or skilled rehabilitative care, which can only be provided in a skilled nursing inpatient um, setting. And it's important to note that skilled care does not include custodial or long-term care when it's the only type of care that you're receiving in a facility. So custodial care, what we call custodial care, is care that helps you with your usual daily activities. You know, getting in and out of bed, eating, bathing, dressing, using the bathroom. Um, can also include things that people normally can do for themselves, uh, using eye drops or uh, their oxygen or taking care of a colostomy or catheter. So all of these things, um, if they don't accompany a skilled need, are, are not going to meet the requirements for coverage um, by Medicare. And um, most of us have experienced situations with loved ones where we've seen that someone may go into a facility needing skilled care, um, getting that skilled care for a short period of time, and then it comes to a point where the health plan, um, or Medicare in this case, decides that the patient is no longer um, benefiting or certified to need skilled care. And there's still a need for custodial care, which could last several months or even years beyond. That's where it becomes important to understand that Medicare does not cover long-term care and that it is very important to address the possibility of needing um, support for custodial care. And the only way to get that is through, uh, in, in terms of insurance, is, is really through a, a long-term care insurance policy. So um, additional requirements of skilled nursing care, you have to be hospitalized for three days as an inpatient a minimum of three days before going to the skilled nursing facility, which means you can't go from home to skilled nursing. You have to you have to go into the hospital first in order for skilled nursing to be covered. You also have to be um, admitted to skilled nursing within 30 days after leaving the hospital. And um, there's rules about it has to be for the treat the condition that was treated in the hospital or one that arose um, following. Uh, treatment for in that hospital. So, um, and obviously it has to be a Medicare participating skilled nursing facility. So not all facilities are in the
the Medicare approved network. And um, this is, you know, this is a, a difficulty sometimes to understand, especially if you have a situation where you're admitted to the hospital, but they admit you not as an inpatient, but what they call observation status. Um, so you could be in the hospital for three or more days, um, but if it's considered as observation status, it does not count as, as inpatient. In terms of what Medicare Part A covers for a skilled nursing facility, again, as long as you meet the criteria um, by Medicare, then the first 20 days are going to be covered in full and without a copayment. After the 20th day, you'll, you'll be responsible for a copayment of $170 per day, and um, your benefits are exhausted after 100 days. So that's the maximum skilled nursing facility, even if you still do need skilled care afterwards. There's no more coverage after that 100 days. And um, something to also consider is that if you, this is all tied into that benefit period that we discussed earlier. So if you end up going back into the hospital, you can requalify for a new benefit period if you're in the hospital for three days, and that, that opens up a whole new 100-day skilled nursing facility benefit period. So let's move on to Part B, medical insurance, your outpatient coverage uh, primarily. And um, first of all, understanding that your Part B medical insurance has a calendar year deductible that you're responsible for paying in full. And for 2019, that deductible is $185. After the deductible, Part B medical insurance covers 80%, and you're responsible for 20%. This plan design might sound familiar to you if you remember the old insurance plans of, of uh, you know, several years ago when before HMOs and managed care and all that stuff, we had major medical insurance and hospitalization might be covered in full and then the outpatient coverage would be covered at 80% with a 20% cost sharing on your part. And Medicare still has that. This is the original Medicare um, that dates back to those days. And so under Part B, after your deductible, you're going to have 80% coverage for doctor visits, um, outpatient medical tests, lab, x-ray, um, diabetic testing supplies, some preventative services, and also home health care. So even though home health care is covered by Part A, if you use up your um, home health care visits under Part A, then there's additional coverage under Part B. So what does... Uh, Part B insurance costs. There is a cost for this. Unlike Part A, which is free for most, um, Part B has a standard premium of $135.50 um, for 2019. For those who are new to M Medicare or if you're not yet receiving Social Security, this is the premium that you'll pay. Um, note that if you're already on Social Security, you may be paying much uh, much less than this amount because there's a provision, a hold harmless provision as part of Social Security that says that um, they would not increase your Part B premium by more than what you're getting in, what you're getting as an increase in Social Security. So in other words, if inflation, um, let's say for Social Security is zero and you're getting no increase in Social Security from one year to the next, then they won't, then Social Security would not impose an increase on your Part B premiums. But people who are, are, are not yet receiving Social Security don't have this uh, protection, and um, so they, they would be paying the, the full new amount. The Social Security increase, by the way, for 2019 is slated to go up for, so Social Security benefits are to increase by 2.8% which is uh, greater than the uh, increase in premium for Part B. So we do expect that most beneficiaries will have an increase in their Part B premium for 2019. There are certain individuals with higher income um, that will have to pay an additional income-based premium for both Part B and Part D drug coverage, which we'll get to later. So Irma, our good friend Irma, 
is the um, income-related monthly adjustment amount for your Part B Medicare premiums. And um, here is a chart that shows your 2018 and 2019 amounts um, that are required depending on your tax filing status. So whether you're single uh, and filing individually or married and filing a joint return, um, your modified adjusted gross income is taken into consideration to see what your Part B premium is going to be. So in 2018, the basic Part B premium was 134, as I just mentioned, that's going up to 135.50 in 2019. And looking down from there, you can see that there is, um, you can pay as much as, instead of the 135, you could be paying as much as 460,000, um, depending on your tax bracket in 2019. The government uses your tax return to determine the income bracket that you fall into. So for 2019, what they're looking back to is um, they're looking at your 2017 tax return and they're pulling out your modified adjusted gross income. So if you want to check that yourself, um, it's the last number on the first page of your, um, your tax return. And it's also the first number on the second page of your tax return. So whatever that number is, is going to determine what um, whether you are subject to an income-related adjustment in 2019 and how much that will be. And as mentioned earlier, Social Security is the one that, um, that will take care of collecting your premium. <clears throat> um, if you have a life-changing event, like let's say that you are retiring in, um, at the first of the year, then your income for 2019 is going to be drastically different or could be drastically different than what it was in 2017. So there is a way, uh, there's a form and a process for appealing the income-related assessment if um, you expect that uh, due to this life-changing event that you're going to have a drastic change in your income. Um, Part D plans, I mentioned uh, higher income earners will also pay an adjusted premium for Part D prescription plans in addition to this Part B shown in the chart. Well, I hope I'm keeping all of you um, interested and um, informed. I'm not going too fast or too slow for you, and I'm telling you something that you haven't um, heard before that you didn't know before. But how and when can you enroll in Medicare is the next, uh, now that we've covered original Medicare, um, part A and B I want to move on to. So Medicare enrollment rules and decisions are going to vary based on your age, on what coverage you currently have. For example, if you have coverage from your employer, um, if you have a disability like end-stage renal disease, and whether you're already receiving um, Social Security or, or retirement benefits. If you're already getting Social Security or retirement before the age of 65, then you're going to be automatically enrolled in Part A and B without any additional application as you approach age 65. You'll get your initial enrollment period package, which includes your new Medicare card and other information about three months before you turn 65. Or in the case of someone who is receiving Social Security disability, about three months before the 25th month of your disability benefits. Um, you, if you're automatically enrolled but you don't want Part B, then you can fill out the back of your Medicare card and mail it back to them, saying, I don't want Part B right now. Um, but honestly, most uh, most retirees today, if you're a baby boomer, um, knowing that you have to wait at least until age 65 to qualify for full Social Security benefits, um, the federal government decided that there should be no automatic enrollment for Medicare at age 65. So if you're not currently getting benefits from Social Security or railroad retirement and you're turning 65 and you want Medicare, then you must sign up for it. It's not automatic. Um, you should contact Social Security and apply for Medicare about three months before you turn 65. And um, obviously if you I keep saying these are a lot of these. This information is from the government, and they do constantly refer to the railroad retirement. I don't know how many people actually get railroad retirement, but they have their own system. Um, anyway, if you uh, you don't need to be retired to get Medicare, and there's 
different ways that you can enroll. Um, you can go to the Social Security Administration website. Um, I've gone there to uh, enroll people. It's um, it's very easy to use, but we're happy to help you if you're not sure, you know, how to navigate around there. You can also call um, the Social Security 800 number, or you can make an appointment to visit your your local Social Security office if you don't have anything better to do for a few hours. Um, for employers, I just want to mention here that you're going to need to advise your employees on whether they should enroll for Part A and Part B, Part or just Part A, um, depending on the status of your health plan. Also, just a reminder that if you have a health savings account plan for your employees, your employees cannot contribute to their HSA if they're already covered by Medicare, and they can't disenroll from Medicare if they're already receiving Social Security. So there's a couple of caveats there. Um, I just want to say to please be sure to discuss the situation with us, your benefits account executive um, in our office, if you haven't previously done so, so that you can advise your employees properly. So when can you sign up for Medicare? Um, in the next few slides, we're going to discuss um, these acronyms that the federal government uses, the IEP, which is the initial enrollment period, the OEP, which is the open enrollment period, the SEP, which is a special enrollment period, and the GEP, which is the general enrollment period. We do like rules. So your first opportunity to enroll in Medicare is during your initial enrollment period, that IEP, and it lasts seven months. Your coverage starts on the date, on, on the first of the month, depending on when you enroll for Medicare. So if you enroll in the first three months prior to the month of your 65th birthday, then your coverage is going to start on the first of the month in which you turn 65. In other words, my birthday is January 1st. I sign up in October, my I, I, or my, birth my birthday is in January, my coverage is going to start January 1st. It doesn't matter whether my birthday is January 1st or January 31st, it's going to start on the first of the month. Um, if you sign up during January, in that case, or during the month of your birthday, then your coverage is going to take effect on the first of the following month. And similarly, if you sign up in the three months following your 65th birthday, then you're going, your coverage will be postponed to the, um, to the month after you sign up. So um, if you're not eligible for the premium free Part A, you can only enroll in Part A during your initial enrollment period. Um, and if you don't enroll in Part B during your initial enrollment period, you may have to pay a penalty, and it's a lifetime penalty. However, we're going to talk about um, special enrollment and not having that penalty. So um, right now, we are in open enrollment period. That's the time of year, every year, that allows you the opportunity to review your choices and pick a Medicare health plan that works best for you for the next year. Um, if you're already enrolled in Medicare, whether you're covered in a Medicare Advantage, supplemental plan, prescription drug plan, your enrollment period started yesterday, October 15th. It runs through December 7th. And any decision that you make during that time is going to take effect as of January 1st, 2019. That's why right now we're going to see, or we are seeing, lots of advertisements on television uh, or on the newspaper. Um, we're hearing about marketing events from local libraries, Council on Aging, uh, even your place of worship. So there are a lot of uh, especially for Medicare Advantage, but sometimes for Medicare Supplement, um, also a lot of interest in, in getting people to listen to um, the benefits of each carrier's plan. And um, it sometimes can sound too good to be true, which means it probably is too good to be true. There's a lot of concerns um, that you have to consider in choosing a plan. And um, just want to say, please remember that we at the Sylvia Group are your trusted advisors. We're certified to offer several Medicare Advantage plans, Part D plans, supplemental plans, um, dental, vision, long-term care, you name it. Um, our focus is in providing you with um, the help to, to choose the best insurance option 
not only for this enrollment period, but in the years ahead so that we have that long lasting relationship with you um, so that you can call us as your healthcare needs change or your personal situation changes to um, to enlist our help in, in reviewing your decisions. So special enrollment period, very important for employer groups. Um, this is uh, the time if you or your spouse or, or in the case of you as an employer, your employees are still working and plan to keep working after the age of 65. Um, you're not receiving Social Security. Chances are you haven't signed up for Part A and Part B during your initial enrollment period, and now you're over age 65. Um, or maybe you're under age 65 and you're not sure if you need to sign up at age 65 because you're worried about having a penalty. So it's very important to understand your special enrollment period rights. You can postpone enrolling during your initial enrollment period and enroll during a special enrollment period um, without having to be postponed until this other thing, the general enrollment period we're going to talk about soon. But if you're eligible for special enrollment, you don't have to pay a late penalty, um, but the special enrollment period is limited. So who's eligible for special enrollment? You must have a group health plan coverage based on active current employment for either you or your spouse for all of the months you were eligible to enroll in Part B but chose not to. So in other words, you turned 65 in 2017, but you're still working, you're still covered by your employer plan um, or your spouse's employer plan. and um, so once that situation changes, that's going to trigger a special enrollment period. It's the eight months in which you can enroll in Part A and B after your employer group health plan coverage um, terminates. And uh, <clears throat> if you don't enroll within that eight months, then you'll, you're going to have to wait till what's known as the general enrollment period. Um, which not only creates a gap in coverage, but also creates um, the potential for having a to pay a lifetime penalty for your insurance. It's very important to note that COBRA, retiree coverage, long-term workers' comp, and VA coverage is not considered active current employment. And I think the biggest concern here is, um, is for COBRA because um, people have been caught in this trap um, of COBRA and retirement, and I want to make sure that you that everyone understands that. Let's say that you're planning to retire as of July 1st of next year, and your employer um, confirms that your coverage is also going to end as of July 1st of next year. But you're still going, you're still under age 65 at that time. Your birthday is September 5th of 2019, in which at which time you'll turn 65. So. From July 1st on, you're under age 65, you're probably going to want to elect COBRA because otherwise you would have no coverage. If you elect COBRA and you decide to stay on that COBRA for the maximum period that you are entitled to, which is 18 months, then you will have missed your initial enrollment period, um, which entitled you to Medicare as of September 1st. As a result, on January 1st of 2021, your COBRA would end. And the earliest that you could get coverage at that point would be during a general enrollment period, which would bump you out to July 1st of 21. So that means you'd be without coverage for six months, and that postponement could trigger a late enrollment penalty. It has happened. It does happen. So it's really important to understand and um, when you're choosing COBRA, or in the case of employers, when you're counseling employees about their COBRA rights, um, that this is played out to the end to see what's best. So in the circumstances of this employee who wants to retire in July and who won't be 65 until September, the best advice probably for that employee would be to sign up for COBRA for July and August, but also at that time to sign up for um, in, in July to sign up for Medicare Part A and B so that their Medicare coverage can start um, on September 1st, which is their, um, or at least within the initial enrollment period, which would extend three months past that birthday. 
um, but not to stay on COBRA for the full 18 months or else they're going to be in trouble. Um, while we're on the subject of postponing your enrollment in Medicare during active employment, um, there's another issue I just want to mention here. Employers with at least 20 employees on their payroll for the majority of their prior calendar year are subject to a provision called the Medicare Secondary Provision. If you're covered by a small employer that is not subject to these rules, um, then Medicare is going to be primary, which means you may need to enroll in Medicare even though you have your employer's insurance to make sure that you have full coverage um, because uh, without getting both Part A and B coverage um, on your employer health plan, there could be gaps. Um, take time to know how your 65th birthday impacts um, your health insurance, whether you or your spouse are working um, at that time. Make sure to cover that with your employer, um, with us as your insurance advisors, um, as well as the health plan. So I mentioned the general en enrollment period, which is the fourth uh, eligibility period that you can sign up for. So um, initial eligibility is uh, at 65. Open enrollment is annually. Special enrollment is after employment. General enrollment is basically for people who don't enroll during their initial enrollment period. This is the only time that you can get on the plan. Um, it's sort of like um, with individual health insurance right now, if you don't have any insurance and you want to get insurance during the year, you are you can't get insurance until um, open enrollment for individual insurance, which is um, coming up and is effective in January. The general enrollment period for Medicare begins on January 1st. It's, um, it's for three months, January, February, and March. Um, but if you sign up then for general enrollment, then your coverage doesn't even start until July 1st of that year. So in addition, if you have over 12 months since you turned 65, you're likely to have a lifetime penalty that's added to your Part B premium. So let's return to the parts of Medicare and your options for coverage. As we said earlier, uh, original Medicare includes Part A, hospital, Part B, medical. And um, as you know, in those in Medicare, original Medicare, there's some pretty hefty deductibles and copayments. And therefore, many people want to have additional coverage that's provided through a Medicare supplement or commonly known a Medigap policy to help fill in some of those out-of-pocket costs. Um, because Part A and B don't cover prescriptions, you're also going to want to purchase prescription drug coverage, a Part D plan, um, to you know to cover those outpatient prescription coverages or expenses, I should say. <clears throat> the supplemental insurance policy is a private health insurance. It's designed to supplement original health care. This means that it pays some of the health care costs that original Medicare doesn't cover, like copayments, co coinsurance and deductibles. So if you have original Medicare and Medigap, Medicare first pays its share of Medicare approved amounts for covered care, and then your Medigap policy pays its share. And you have to have both Part A and B Medicare in order to have a Medigap policy. Um, these policies allow you to see any provider who is contracted with Medicare, so there's no network, there's no referrals, you don't need referrals, um, you're not limited to who you can see. If they accept Medicare, you can go there, um, which is unlike the Medicare Advantage plans we're going to talk about. In Massachusetts, there's actually only two approved Medicare uh, supplement plan designs. One is called the core plan. The other is called Supplemental One. The most significant difference in these plans is that the core plan does not cover the Part A and Part B deductibles nor does it cover skilled nursing facility co-payments um, after the first 20 days, whereas if you purchase a Supplemental One plan, it covers all Medicare deductibles, all Medicare co-insurance, all Medicare um, co-payments. So virtually ending up with 100% coverage for Medicare-approved services. 
Um, since Medigap policies only provide medical coverage to supplement original Medicare, um, you do, as I mentioned, need to um, purchase a separate prescription drug plan. So Part D plans, they were uh, introduced in 2006, as I said, as part of the Medicare Modernization Act, and there are now over 43 million beneficiaries that are covered um, by Part D plans, either through standalone plans that we're going to talk about or plans that are um, part of the Medicare Advantage. Your cost for prescription drug coverage will depend on which plan you choose and some other factors, um, such as which drugs you take, um, whether you use a pharmacy in your network, uh, in your uh, retail pharmacy, or mail order, and, um, and some people might qualify for extra help. Most people pay a monthly premium for their prescription coverage, in addition to any deductibles or cost sharing that are in the prescription drug plan. So in 2019, the maximum deductible for a Part D plan is $415. Um, there is a range in Massachusetts. There are 20, 20 plus um, prescription drug plans available, standalone, and some of them have no deductible. Some might have a couple hundred dollars, but n no one can exceed the $415 in their plan design. Um, once the deductible has met, has been met, if it's applicable, then uh, plans will have a copayment or coinsurance um, for covered drugs, depending on whether they're generic preferred brand dr drugs or higher tier non-preferred. You can use the Medicare website to shop for drug plans based on your overall cost by entering sp the specific medications that you take, the pharmacy that you go to, et cetera, and come up with a plan that shows you, um, compares each plan based on total cost of premium and um, you know your out-of-pocket costs. If you have considerable prescription drug expenses, you're going to um, find yourself potentially entering into the coverage gap in Part D. This point is reached when the total cost of covered drugs that you um, that are covered by your plan reach a dollar limit that's set for um, 2019. It's set at $3,820. So that's your un initial coverage. And once you've exceeded that amount, you go into what's known as the coverage gap or what used to be called the donut hole when it first came out. And um, what happens at this point is that you you will now be responsible for paying 25% of brand name drugs or 37% for generic drugs. And um, the pharmaceutical companies are picking up, they're subsidizing your costs. That's why you're only paying 20%, 25% of the brand name drug costs because the pharmacy companies are paying the majority of costs at that time. Um, when Part D plans for, were first offered in 2006, um, people had to pay 100% of the, in other words, they had no coverage during the coverage gap or the donut hole. They were responsible for 100% of their drug costs until they reached the catastrophic level. But this donut hole has been shrinking um, as part of, first of all, as part of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare that was passed, and then uh, most recently, last year, uh, 2018, or this year actually, there was um, a further reduction in payments passed through uh, legislation. So um, once your out-of-pocket costs, so how much you're paying for your prescription drugs reaches $5,100 in 2019, then you enter into what's called catastrophic coverage, at which point your, your costs are going to drastically um, reduce at that point. Of course, at that point, you've already paid $5,100 for, for medicine. So, um, yes, everything that you've heard about how strange this prescription drug plan is, is pretty much true. Um, this Part D plan is, is like nothing that we really see in, um, in traditional health insurance plans and group health plans. And honestly, I hope that we never do see something like this because it's pretty confusing to um, explain but that's what we're here for also. Um, your drug plan, by the way, your Part D plan, the premium can be paid directly from your Social Security check if you're receiving Social Security. So even though the coverage is provided by private insurance, Social Security um, does collect premium for this through your checks if you'd like to have it deducted. 
I hope we're doing okay on time um, so that we have questions at the end. But if we don't have questions, as been mentioned, then we'll, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you and share whatever information we can. So each plan has a formulary or a list of covered drugs in Plan D. Um, the formulary, the formulary um, must include a range of drugs in the most commonly prescribed, prescribed categories to make sure that people with different medical conditions can get the treatment they need. Um, there are certain protect, um, protections within the Part D legislation where um, treatments for all drugs regardless, so that the formulary can't exclude any drugs um, when they're for treatment of like cancer, HIV, antipsychotic, and immunosuppressant medications. So, um, you know, there's definitely some protections built into this. You may have to pay a penalty if you don't enroll during your initial enrollment period for Part D, and the penalty is assessed for every month that you delay enrolling. So we do run into situations sometimes where people say, well, I don't really take any medications. Um, I'm not going to get Part D. And then three years later, they come in and they say, oh, I, you know, I, I have to take all these medications. It's so expensive. I want to get a Part D plan. And we calculate the penalty that applies on top of the premium. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it it's sort of being not buying insurance initially is uh, a little of being penny wise and pound foolish because there are plans as low premium as $12 a month, I think. So it's you know generally recommended to, to get your Part D insurance when you need to uh, or when you're responsible for getting it, um, even if you don't, don't need it for now. Um, for employees on the call, I know that you're familiar with the annual notice of credible coverage that you're required to provide to your employees annually. And I want to mention that CMS also requires that you annually declare your, your drug plan status in an online report. And this is due within 60 days following your plan anniversary date. And it's very important to do this because failure to notify CMS that you have credible coverage for your employees may end up uh, resulting in your employees getting assessed a late enrollment penalty when they finally do terminate from your plan and enroll in a Part D plan, what they consider on a timely basis, but CMS might look at it and say that they're a late enrollee because they're not aware that your employee had credible coverage. If we can be of any help to you and, um, and that compliance issue, please let your account executive know. So last topic, uh, Medicare Advantage plans. What are these plans? They're private insurance plans approved by Medicare to provide your health coverage. And in most um, Medicare Advantage plans, you need to use the plans network of doctors, hospitals, and other providers. In HMO type plans, you must obtain referrals and stay within the network. In PPO type plans, you may receive treatment out of network, um, but will likely have to pay more, more um, for that care out of network. Um, and PPO plans do, some of them do have national networks, so that works for uh, snowbirds. Um, if you join a Medicare plan, um, you should know that you are still in Medicare with all the rights and protections. Um, but for all intents and purposes, you trade in your original Medicare card for your Medicare Advantage card. Um, you still get services covered by Part A and Part B. Um, but the Medicare Advantage plan may cover these services a little bit differently. Um, most Medicare plans include Part D prescription. What is especially attractive about these plans is they include extra benefits um, that aren't typically covered by Medicare, such as vision and dental. Um, and more and more benefits are being added to Medicare Advantage plans as enticement to enroll in these plans. So expect to see added benefits in the future. Even if you're on the supplement now, um, you might be more interested in an Advantage plan in the future. Um, you cannot have a Medigap plan with Medicare Advantage. And the most important thing to, to do when you're considering Medicare Advantage plan is first to say, is your doctor in their network, or are your doctors, plural, in the network, and are your medications covered, and what, what's the cost um, co-payment to you for your medical services and, and um, for your prescriptions. I'm going to switch, uh, just 
skip this um, right now, um, except to say that um, there are certain times that you can change Medicare Advantage during the year. The most important thing to know is that if you move out of your planned service area, this creates a special enrollment period. Um, however, if you have Medicare Supplement and not Medicare Advantage, and you change your resident, that Medicare Supplement plan can go with you. Um, you don't need to change it. So before we wrap up today, I'd like to share this slide with you, which outlines how Medicare coordinates with your group health plan. Um, Medicare pays first for people with employer group health plans if um, they're in these circumstances. So 65 or older with retiree coverage, 65 or older with active um, health insurance through their employer if the employer has less than 20 employees, under 65 with a disability and your employer has less than 100 employees, or um, in the case of end stage renal disease um, during the first or after the first 30 months. These are the circumstances in which Medicare pays first. Conversely, your health plan pays first. Um, if you are 65 or older and your employer has more than 20 employees, if you have a disability under age 65 and your employer has more than 100 employees, or end-stage renal disease during the first 30 months. So these situations can get very tricky to decipher. Um, just be sure to enlist the help of your group health plan. Um, when in doubt, and your account executive to make sure that you tell your employees or that you counsel your employees um, to what they have. So that's the end of the um, Medicare presentation. I'm looking forward to next month. I want to mention that November is Long-Term Care Awareness Month. Alan Woods, um, a very knowledgeable, awesome colleague of ours, um, will be presenting a live seminar at our offices on November 1st no cost to you, um, please register. We um, spend a lot of time understanding Medicare and making decisions on our health care needs there. Um, but we often look, overlook the significant cost of long-term care, which is not covered by Medicare. So I hope that you'll enjoy me and enjoy, uh, that you'll join me and enjoy Ellen um, as she provides this informative seminar on November 1st. And look in your email for um, for an invitation. Then, do you want to say anything else at this point? Oh, I, I think uh, I think we're ready to wrap things up, Julie. And uh, thank you, and thank you to all our attendees. Um, as Julie was just saying, you can look for an email from Sylvia Group uh, with an invitation to the long term long term care insurance seminar that will be sent out on Thursday. And the invitation will include a button to click for easy online registration. You can also register by emailing our marketing and events coordinator, Lauren Hool, at lhool, that's L-H-O-U-L-E, at sylviagroup.com. Um, we'll also be posting a blog post by the end of the week with a recording of this webinar, if you'd like to view it again. And we'll also have um, some other information in the blog post as well. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.